let me welcome you to our I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have distinguished photographer Lucas Folia as tonight's guest speaker. Lucas grew up on a small family farm in New York and currently lives in San Francisco. His photographs examine the relationship between human belief systems and the natural world. He has published three monographs to date, A Natural Order, 2012, Front Country, 2014, and Human Nature, 2017, all from Nasrelli Press. His exhibitions are too numerous to mention here. His work is in notable collections, including International Center of Photography, San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and Victoria and Albert Museum. Editorial clients include National Geographic Magazine and the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Lucas also collaborates with nonprofit organizations, including Sierra Club and the Nature Conservancy. It's going to be a fascinating evening. Lucas, thank you so much for being with us. And please, everybody, help me welcome Lucas to our lecture series. Virtual clapping is OK. <laughs> thank you, Lucas. You know, it's interesting because for, for the work that I do, everything is about interpersonal relationships, right? So in, when I go out and photograph, I'm meeting people. If they trust me, they introduce me to their friends, their friends will trust me. The art world feels the same way, right? Whether I'm working with a publisher, a gallerist, a curator, an editor, or a critic, or another artist, trust matters, right? And so much of my life is fueled by me saying, hi, my name is Lucas, and then having a conversation. Virtually, that's more difficult. And I imagine for all of you listening, you're navigating a time where your expectations for this year and your lived experience of this year are very different. And the thing I've been thinking about a lot recently is that when I was in art school, I experienced a lot of critiques. People told me they liked what I did, they didn't like what I did, they told me all the nuanced reasons why they liked what I did or they didn't like what I did. And it was a struggle for me to know whether I should listen or not listen until about halfway through and I realized that all I needed to do was react. And if I could react to what I was hearing, then whether it was a positive critique or a negative critique, I could use that critique as fuel to figure out whatever I could do. So in this moment in history, as weird and strange and unjust as it is, I'm trying to use the moment and react to it. Right? And I hope for all of you, as you look at your own work and your own practice and your own circumstance, that you can react to where you are and find a way to make work that serves yourself, that feels meaningful and feels personal, and that also serves a purpose in the world. Right? There are so many things in the world that we could deal with and, and navigate and talk about. Right? For tonight, I'm going to talk about my own journey and process, um, but just a message to start off with that. I hope that this moment, as messed up as it is, can bring you fuel. I usually start talks with a photograph of my family's farm in New York. It's about 30 miles from New York City on Long Island. Small farm, 10 acres with some forest behind it. This is a photograph from when I was a child of my grandfather drying onions with my, my younger sister and our dog, Raven. Um, I share that because the place where I grew up is in large part an inspiration for the type of work that I do. Um, let's see if I can. So this is the farm itself. Growing up, we grew most of our food. I spent a lot of time in that forest behind the farm. We used the plants that we grew as a currency, so we bartered for everything from shoes to dentistry. Uh, my grandparents lived next door to my parents. My aunt and uncle lived across the street. It felt like a community in the context of a lot of change. Because as I was growing up, the highway near our house allowed people to commute into New York City and the land around us was developed into suburban housing. And by the time I was a teenager, the suburban homes looked down on us and my family also had cars, computers, obviously electricity. We were very much a part of both the suburban lifestyle that surrounded us and an agricultural lifestyle with, that I was raised in. So when I started to make photographs, I decided to, felt meaningful to me to concentrate on people's relationship to land and how we, we maintain connections to the physical landscape 
even as there are so many economic and technological incentives to change and to leave. Um, no matter how long I photograph and how much I photograph, I keep on forgetting the basic rule that if you're looking through the camera and backing up, look where you're going. When I was 23, my father and I built a bed in the back of a used minivan. And I had just graduated from undergrad. Um, I didn't really know how I was going to make a living. But I knew that if I could freelance and do odd jobs, event photography, political work, working for nonprofits at sliding scale, and if I lived cheap, I could save up enough money to then live out of my car and travel and photograph. Um, I remember a line that I heard early on from Malcolm X that th the world can call you a lot of different names, but you are the name you answer to. And so always, as I was doing all these different jobs just to make a basic living in order to photograph, the only thing I would talk about when someone asked me what I did was the project that I cared about. So the first idea that I, that I went out to look at, the, look at and photograph after school was for a series called The Natural Order. And I was, I was, through friends of friends of my family, interested in meeting people who like my family, chose to live in a close connection to the landscape, but who did so to more of an absolute, right? who lived without grid-tied electricity, who hunted and gathered the majority of their food, built their own homes, um, water from streams or, or, uh, or creeks, etc. So I had this idea of finding off-grid people who are living self-sufficiently. But I went socially. Through a friend of a friend, I was introduced to Acorn. This is one of the first photographs I made in the series. He's holding roadkill possum stew. And I spent a couple days at the community where he was living called Wild Roots Homestead in North Carolina. The Wild Roots Homestead very much was an inspiration for the projects. I saw people living to that level of self-sufficiency that I hadn't yet seen before. But my goal in going to photograph in these places was to make a photograph that with its content, its color, its composition, compelled someone to look at it and left them asking questions so they'd want to learn more. So as much as I tell you the backstories to these photographs, my hope is that the actual image provokes you to keep on asking questions, to keep on looking. And that if I give you enough information in my story that also is, are in the captions to the photographs that I publish, put online, put in magazines, put in books, put it in exhibitions, etc. They allow you to learn more if you want to. The communities I photographed, as I mentioned, uh, were filled with people who wanted to be self-sufficient. The Wild Roots Homestead in North Carolina, during winters on the occasion when it snowed, used their wattle and daub homes and covered the windows with deer hides to hold in the heat. Through some of the anarcho-primitivist -primitive, communities and naturalist communities that I started photographing. I was introduced to some plain communities in Tennessee and Kentucky who dressed as Mennonites or Amish families, but who weren't directly a part of that lineage. So people who were using the identity of a Christian lifestyle to avoid government and live as self-sufficiently as they could without interference from the state. This is Rita and Cora Aiming in Tennessee. Got to know a community in, called Kevin's Land in Virginia. Again, everywhere I went, as I got to know people, I was introduced to them because I knew one of their friends. Because their friend trusted me, they trusted me. And then every time I made photographs, I brought the copies of those photographs back to the people I was photographing. So in a circumstance like this with Patrick and his daughter Anakista, I had spent the previous week or more just hanging out on their farm and helping them do the everyday tasks that they were doing because it felt meaningful to me to just visit and get to know them. And then when we were swimming after work one day, uh, Anakista climbed on Patrick's chest and I made a photograph that felt like it was personal to me. It had felt like it was my, an image that felt like I authored it. My favorite pictures tend to come from everyday life, but they tend to be moments that are slightly extraordinary 
that I take out of context and then show alone. This is James's wigwam, also at uh, the Wild Roots Homestead in North Carolina. I love the fact that he had uh, an extreme Africa edition of National Geographic on his uh, floor. This is Victoria bringing in the goats. Andrew and Torin. Oftentimes I would go into places with an idea of what I would find, but almost invariably my favorite images were never the thing I expected to make. In this circumstance, it was Torin's idea, this young boy, to have his father squirt milk into his mouth. So oftentimes the relationship I make through friends and friends of friends gets me into a place. And the trust that people have in me, have in me and the photographs I bring back to them makes them excited about me being there to photograph them. And through their excitement come these opportunities to photograph. And in response to those circumstances, I make pictures. So Watermelon Patch, a Twin Oaks community in Virginia. It's one of the very few remaining income sharing communes in the United States. Valerie with her father, father's shadow. And a bear killed by neighbors at Kevin's Land in Virginia it was poisoned. When I first saw this, this image of the bear, um, I didn't know if I should even photograph it because it didn't overtly, wasn't overtly part of my series. It wasn't, the bear never in its life wasn't directly involved with the community I was photographing. Where it dies is actually on the border of the neighbor's land. But the humanness of the figure of that bear and the idea that we are not that different struck me, but more so I just couldn't not look at it. And I learned a lesson where if I go out in the world with an idea that I'm trying to photograph or a story I'm trying to make, when I come home, if I let the best photographs move to their own pile, so if I select the best photographs and then see what those photographs are creating as a story, then that's a more powerful story. So I try to go off into the world with a question, a story I'm trying to make, and then I let the best photographs redefine the story before I show it to the world. This is Lunea with a venison rib or deer rib. And George and Christina, Christina and their family. Christina is holding the photograph that George made on their wedding day. They met in a motorcycle club in uh, New Jersey. Um, George still has the tattoos in his arm. They, George was a, a nuclear engineer and because of his fear of nuclear technology, because they converted to a Christian Israelite faith, they moved off the grid in rural Tennessee and raised their children there. The photograph that, that, that she's holding is one of the few things they brought with them. I photographed Cora's family for years. The project that I'm showing you started in 2006 when I was 23 and finished in uh, 2010 or 11. Um, about midway through the project, um, Cora and her family were hosting a man who had been kicked out of a local Christian community for flirting too much um, named Will, and he was staying on, on the floor of the schoolhouse. Um, one day he had scribbled over the, over the board um, just notes that kind of mixed around the notes that Cora's homeschooling teacher had written. And Cora had this idea that I'd go photograph the chalkboard. And then while I was photographing the chalkboard, Cora's dad said, hey, Cora, circle the things you're supposed to remember. And as she was trying to circle those things, she got frustrated and put her head in her hands, head in her arm. And then I made this picture. I described the circumstance of that because while not being a posed image, it's an image that is a result of me being in a place and people being excited about me being there. So in no way is this a story in which I'm a fly on the wall showing the everyday life of people. For me, this is a story of me being in a place with people who share a value system. And in photographing them, I'm learning more about my value system in response to them. And through friendship, we make pictures. This is Mason 
He, he and his family live off grid in Kentucky. No one in the family has social security numbers because they haven't lived on grid since the invention of the social security system. When I was thinking of a title for the book, I thought of a conversation with a man named Frank who lives at the Miccosukee Land Co-op in Tallahassee, Florida. And he said, the natural order of things is when a species gets dominant in its niche, it overruns it completely to the point where it eats all of its food and then it crashes and burns. In my opinion, if we ever succeed in being sustainable, it will be the first non-natural thing we've ever done. I don't necessarily agree with this statement. I think that we have potential for sustainability. I think that potential is actually natural. And I think it's possible. At the same time, similarly to how I want my photographs to pose questions, I wanted the title of the book, A Natural Order, to also pose a question and have people relate to it and reflect on it on their own lives. This is David in his wigwam in one of the last days I photographed for the project. A friend recently shared that if you photograph your father and make a bad picture of your father, no one is gonna care about your father. But if you photograph your father, make a good photograph of your father, someone will care about your father. But if you make a great photograph of your father, people will look at your photograph and think of their own father and their own relationships. My hope with this series is not to make people want to live exactly like this, because I don't think it's sustainable or practical for the entire world to live off grid. I don't wanna be propagandist. My hope is that the series poses questions and inspires people to look back at their own lives, for you to look back at your own life and think about what behaviors you do that relate to the landscape, what you could do that could be sustainable. What does sustainability mean? These are questions that were circling around my head that I hope I can translate through the photographs to the people who are looking at them. This is Gabriel and his mom, Rebecca, wearing two squirrels in her loincloth. This is Cecilia aiming her shotgun. When the project was done, I thought of the project itself like the trunk of a tree and the different ways I put the project out in the world like branches from that tree. The first thing I made was a book through an artist who believes in my work named Richard Mizrak. I was introduced to a publisher named, a name, a publisher named Chris Pickler from Nazareli Press because Richard told Chris that he trusted me. Chris trusted me and offered to do a book. As we were doing the book, um, also because of the photographs, obviously, but the, um, as we were making the book, I tried to have the series mix together all the people I was photographing rather than chapter them as separate communities because I was interested in their, their common ideal of self-sufficiency. I also made prints because I care about the craft the physical object of a print, put up in exhibitions. And it's been meaningful to me to see all the different iterations of these projects, right? I like being able to do exhibitions. I love being able to do books. I also like giving stories to magazines so it can become more easily available. I put the entire series on my website so it's available for free, right? I give copies back to the people I photographed. All of these things to me are branches of the tree whereas the trunk is the project itself. And I share that because I think oftentimes we're incentivized as photographers to define ourselves in a limiting way. You are a fine art photographer, you are an editorial photographer, a commercial photographer. What's been important to me is that I keep my values with me in every use of the pictures, but that I can also maximize how I share this art with the world by accessing the range of possibilities in photography. When I finished that project, one of my best friends had moved to Wyoming to be a, a local radio host. And the story she shared with me focused on a landscape that was bigger and wilder than any place I'd ever been. And even though I talked casually about wilderness and wildness, when photographing for my first book in the Southeastern United States, 
in Virginia, Kentucky, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. It didn't, I realized that the land there still for the most part made people and our settlements feel bigger than the wild land that was left. When I went to visit Wyoming and Nevada for the first time, the landscape felt much bigger than me. When I met George, the man with the yellow pickup truck in this photograph, he took me on a, on a dirt road with the dust coming up through the bottom of the truck to the edge of a hill with a wildfire burning on the other side. And I felt that cloud and the heat hit our faces as we got out of the car. And I was scared. It, I, it was a new experience for me to be in a place that felt that wild. Um, I told this to George and, and he said, don't worry about it. I got safety provisions. I asked him what that meant. And he said he had two candy bars, a, a diet Coke, um, a bottle of water, a shovel and a handgun. This is Casey and Rowdy horse training. The American West is famous for its wildness and the images of the West are men on horseback, uh, people on horseback and ghost towns and wilderness. Uh, I learned early on in photography that I can find what I'm looking for. So at this ranch up against the Ruby Mountains in Nevada, um, all the, the staff still herd cattle on horseback. And in this case, Casey is teaching his horse not to pull back on the rope um, when a, not, to, not to buck when a cow pulls back on the rope. I like the triangle of the dog and the two, the two men on their horses and the rope tying them together. This is Tommy. Uh, similar to the circumstance I described earlier, as I got to know families across a fairly wide area of the Intermountain West over the years of this project, um, they came up with ideas. I was photographing the Big Springs Ranch in Nevada on the last year before it was turned into a gold mine. And Tommy, on one of the last days I came to photograph, said that he wanted to show me how he could shoot a coyote while standing on top of a fence pole. So he drove out across the ranch and he climbed up the fence pole and I set up my camera to photograph him. And then just before he could pose, he fell off the pole with a loaded gun. And I photographed him the moment before he fell. I felt really connected to the, a, Mort, the, a family called the Mortensen family in Afton, Wyoming, because like my family, they had the last farm left in a town that had otherwise been suburbanized. And when I was staying with them, the parents were away at one point. It was just me and the kids, some of whom were older. Um, but none of whom had killed a cow. And one of their cows sat down, didn't get up. It's called a downer. And the family decided to kill the cow before it died so they could use the meat. I'm a vegetarian. My family grew vegetables. I have never killed a cow, but the family asked me to kill a cow. My mom got home, asked me to help. I said yes. Um, and then I said, I really have no idea what I'm doing. So they called the local school teacher named Adam. And as Adam was aiming the gun, I set up my camera and took a picture and the sound of my camera made the cow look at me and I made another portrait of the cow. And then the cow died, it was cut up and, and used as meat. Um, I decided when I was editing all these pictures to not use any other photograph besides this moment because the intimacy of that glance with the unanswered question of what will happen next to me is so much more interesting than providing people with visual answers. So I want people to keep on looking and asking questions and hopefully learning more. When this book was published, I had made 45,000, uh, 60,000 pictures. I made 45,000 for the first book, about 60,000 pictures for the second book. Edited them down to 60, I chose to include this picture. 
And as the book was published, CNN called me and said they wanted to do a review of the book. They asked me some questions over the phone. I sent them some pictures over email. And then a week later, I got an, an, a call from Adam saying, my photograph is online. And it says that the opening line of the article says that um, a Wyoming school teacher is aiming a gun at his victim. And I said, oh, Adam, I'm sorry. Give me 10 minutes, I'll try to get it offline. And then there was a pause over the phone. And Adam said, wait, no, actually, I kind of like being on CNN. And we kept the article live. In my experience, people trusting me and trusting the process of how I photograph also allows them to trust their image being out in the world. And I try to keep people in touch in the process. Uh, this is bailing hay on the high desert in Nevada. As other parts of the world um, grow drier, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, as they've been pulling up a lot of water for a long time, um, the market for hay from the U.S. sells to them. So this farmer in Nevada was selling hay to Saudi Arabian farmers because the government is subsidizing those farmers because they're using the water to pump down oil wells to pull up more oil. So as local as I go in rural communities across the United States, I still feel connected to a larger global ecosystem and global economy. So the bank in Silverton, Texas, 90% of the farmers in the small town of Silverton are on loans for the bank to pay for the seeds and the, and the equipment needed for each season. Um, I asked the bank um, manager what the donkey heads represented on the wall, and he said he had no idea they'd been there for generations. This is Jaime and other ranch hands at the, a ranch in rural Nevada, working under H-4A visas that the whole industry relies on. I learned early on to say yes. For instance, um, I was in Jackson, Wyoming, and I met a judge, and he told me that he wanted me to photograph his daughter's birthday party. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, at this point in life, I'm trying to be a full-time fine art documentary photographer. I don't photograph birthday parties anymore. And he said, well, I'm the judge, and I'll see you at 10 a.m. And I showed up at his house, and I made very, very not interesting pictures of kids cutting birthday cake and parents smiling together. And after the birthday party, people got into like a, a fight with maybe whipped cream or something, foam, something or other, and felt so not like what I was doing. But Amanda, the judge's daughter, um, took a hose and washed herself off with the storm clouds over the mountains behind her. And that picture felt like it fit into my project. And the other pictures I made felt like it fit into the family's project. And I gave the pictures back to the family and I used this photograph of Amanda in my book and in the art, art exhibitions. And the whole thing felt meaningful in the end. This is Ela and Bly, the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. That's a Shoshone and Arapaho reservation that has within it the greatest section, the largest section of roadless land south in, within the United States um, besides Alaska. Also on that reservation, I met a missionary named Ron. And this is a photograph of Ron and his pet bobcat named Bob. Ron uh, told me that he, he found the bobcat as a kitten that he thought was a cat on the road and adopted it, fearing that it was left by someone. And then once it was adopted, it kept on growing into the size of a bobcat, as it was. And they stayed connected. I spent maybe three or four weeks traveling with a group of Peruvian sheep herders, Oscar and Wilson, over the desert in Wyoming. They, they spent about a year herding bands of 2,000 sheep 
without seeing a town. And as I was editing the photographs from the book, every other photograph that I made during that month felt literal, like it felt very descriptive, but didn't make me ask questions. And in the end, working with Nasrelli Press, we decided to just include this one image of their dogs mounting when they're supposed to be guarding sheep. Oftentimes when I photograph, I see a, a composition before I see a moment happen within that composition. So I got to know the school teachers and some of the students at the Afton, the high school in Afton, a small town in a very rural part of Western Wyoming and was allowed to photograph their soccer practice. And I like the juxtaposition of the snowy mountains with the colorful heated field paid for by a local uh, fertilizer mine. And I set up my camera with that composition in mind and photographed for the whole afternoon. And there was one moment when all the, all the boys bunched up waiting for a soccer ball. And that moment felt alive and real in the, in, in the context of a very composed scene. And it stayed with me and I've used it. Other moments just happen. My, I was living out of my minivan. If any of you decide to live out of a car in the winter in Wyoming, it's really cold. I recommend a futon, a sleeping bag, and a down blanket to stay warm. Um, my car died at one point and, uh, during, the, during the trip, and I hitchhiked to the nearest town. And while hitchhiking, we passed some cows and I sat out of the window with my camera and made this photograph as we were driving by. Ron is the town historian of Auburn, Wyoming. He said he's excited about me using this photograph as long as I tell people that his town should become famous for its hot springs. So if you're ever passing through Auburn, Wyoming, ask for Ron and he'll show you the hot springs. These are the parts of a, of a cow that we don't eat on, the, on a ranch in rural Wyoming. It's one of the last off-grid ranches in the area. This is national forest land on the edge of the, uh, near, sort of near um, Jackson Hole and the Teton, the Teton National Forest and a highway barrier and a fence and then wild land. And I realized that the wild land that the American West is famous for still feels wild, but people are very evident within it. Um, national forest land is leased for, for logging, for mining, for other uses. And for instance, the elk that live up in the mountains um, during the summer migrate down towards towns in the winter. And because they cause so much property damage, walking over cars and you know, et cetera, in the towns. The towns now pay to feed the wild elk during the winters so they don't go to eat the food in the towns and also eat the hay from local cattle ranchers. This is a photograph of a domestic horse walking towards wild elk at a feed ground in Wyoming. That interface is what interests me in this series, as how people live in connection to wild land, how a domesticated space relates to a wild space in a landscape that's famous for being wild. I learned by going to these areas that are famous for being wild, that there are very few jobs that allow people to live in small town America that don't take away from the wildness that that landscape is famous for. This also brings up, as I travel, I try not to give long in-depth explanations for what I'm doing to the people I meet because it's really hard for them to then repeat those explanations to other people. I really know what I'm doing in a series if I can say it in one line that someone can understand and tell their friend easily. So for this series, I told people that I was working on a project about the jobs that allow people to live in small town America. And through that one line, and some introductions of friends of friends, I was able to photograph at a private coal-fired power plant in rural Nevada. That coal-fired power plant powers 
the machinery of a gold mine and the electricity of a gold mine. I photographed in the Hamilton Dome oil field in Wyoming, where because of a loophole in the law and the environmental regulations, produced water comes out of the ground, separated from the oil, and is discharged into local river systems. So this is produced water at the Hamilton Dome oil field in Wyoming. As of now, in many of the oil fields in the American West, 100 barrels of oil are taken out of the ground for every one barrel of oil that we use. I bring up that statistic because that held true across every industry I photographed. That at this point, the, for instance, the nuggets of gold that Alice was helping to mine at the Newmont Mining Corporation in Nevada are gone. Right? The nuggets of gold that made the American West famous are gone. What's left is a tenth of an ounce of gold in 2,000 pounds of rock that's crushed and mixed with cyanide to take out the gold. It felt meaningful to me when I was doing this project and editing it in the end to start the series and start the book with images that reference what the American West is famous for. People on horseback, agricultural lifestyles, and wild land. The second half of the book shows the industries that allow people to live in that landscape and that are fueling the economy of the American West. Because until we find another solution, until we give opportunities for jobs, and by we, I mean our country, I mean the world, I mean everyone who's voting and every politician who's representing everyone who's voting. Until we find a solution that allows sustainable jobs to take the place of these other industries, there's not going to be a way to sway those industries and sway people from working for them because there's no other way. Alice, who I showed you two photographs ago, was a beautician making between ten and fifteen thousand dollars a year and tries to trying to raise her kids as a single mother. She got a job driving a truck in a gold mine and could make $80,000 a year. It's hard for someone like Alice to vote for environmental restrictions on mining if there's no other opportunity. So I, need, I think we need restrictions. I think there needs to be change. I don't think there should be a two mile wide hole in a formerly wild landscape for a tiny bits of gold dust. And I also think we need new a new era of different jobs. This is Stanley um, walking home in a small mining town. Another thing I learned about mining is mines are only valuable, whether it's gold, oil, anything in between, copper, coal, etc. cetera. Um, things are only valuable because they're limited. If things are limited, when they're, exhaust, when they're extracted, when, when, the, when the companies take the gold that's there, they leave. And what's left are ghost towns. So I thought it was going to be cowboys trailing cattle through ghost towns, being the nomads of the American West, when in actuality, miners are the modern day nomads following jobs across the country. This is a photograph of a coal-fired power plant in Kemmerer, Wyoming. I was trying to find a way to show how when we burn coal, it literally becomes weather. And I went back to this coal-fired power plant for years as I was traveling between 2006 and 2013. And there was just one day when a windstorm and the right amount of humidity took that plume of exhaust and made it cross the landscape in that surreal way. And, and I use the picture. This is the recycling at a small bar in Eden, Wyoming. It's a one block town with one bar. That's the Eden bar. It's gone through like three come celebrate signs in the time that I went to photograph it because the wind kept on blowing the, ones, the other ones away. This is Charlie, and uh, he asked me to, I met him at a, a local 
uh, rodeo event. And he asked me to come photograph him on the day he took off. He took over a brothel from his mother. A small section of pavement in a park, a gas station parking lot in Wyoming that I thought looked like an aerial landscape. As much as I try to share a story in my, project, in my books and exhibitions that relates to larger messages around the environment, I want to make photographs that as photographs are compelling. So I put this photograph in the book as much as a reminder to me as something to show the world about how photographs can, can transform meaning and create meaning, whether or not something was there in the first place. It's an oil refinery in Laurel, Montana. I went to that town, actually it's the only town I went to where I didn't know anybody. And I went there because my sister's name is Laurel. And I feel a little bad that the only picture I made from there that I liked was of the oil refinery and a house with strange landscaping. And towards the end of the project, I went to the largest natural gas field in the country, the Pinedale Anticline, connected to the Jonah Field in Wyoming. And I wanted to photograph the welders because it's the most dangerous job in the, in the United States. It's people with making hot sparks next to flammable gas. And I went to the, 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 the hub where the welders congregated before going out into the field um, and met Roger. And Roger was much more interested in having me photograph him weightlifting than having me photograph him go off and work in the field. And he's a former special forces, um, works in, in, as a welder because it gets him by, and he loves weightlifting. So I decided to use this picture, and then I used the caption with the photograph to talk about how in the Jonah Field and the Pinedale Anticline, there was formerly, decades ago, an idea that if you set off a nuclear bomb underground, it would create a big enough chasm that natural gas would flow in, and it could then be extracted. So it almost actually happened that we set off a nuclear bomb on our domestic land to get gas, but then it didn't go through, something fell apart, no bomb was exploded, and it wasn't until my generation when fracking fluids, toxic chemicals that dissolve the soil, mixed with small explosions and, dr and holes drilled deep underground would allow for the extraction of gas. Um, that innovation has transformed the American West. It's made new roads in more ways than one. And we are just now seeing its effects. A thing I've noticed as I traveled is it's it's a lot easier to prevent a problem than it is to fix it once it's there. But it's much harder to get people to think about a problem coming up than it is for all of us to think about our immediate needs. So circling back, until there are, there are stable economies across small towns in rural America, it's almost impossible to expect people to say no to industries even if those industries involve the destruction of the wild land for which the region is famous. I thought of this project as activism. When it was finished, I made the book. I gave photographs along the way to nonprofits. They were used in demonstrations in Congress. Uh, one group especially called the Powder, Powder River Basin Resource Council used my images to protest fracking and, and pollution from the oil fields. And I didn't see change because there was such an economic force to keep those industries in these towns. It felt meaningful to have the photographs exhibited around the world. This was from a museum in Germany. Um, but I left the project trying to think about how I could actually make a difference with my photographs without making them into propaganda and without um, restricting my freedom for making interesting photographs. I wanted to be able to, I want to be able to feel creatively free and still feel like my photographs are useful. 
um, I came up with an idea for a series titled Human Nature in which I would find collaborators along the way. So these first images are from a collaboration with National Geographic, which I was doing a series about how time and nature benefits people. Right now, um, the average American spends 93% of their days inside. Our lives are lived on screens. Time outside, I think, is essential to happiness and also productivity. This is a photograph of a man named Matt that I made in that collaboration with National Geographic. Um, he's swinging naked between two trees on the lost coast of California. Matt was living off grid. He was trained as an engineer and he was recently hired by Google X to develop new sustainable technologies. Maddie um, in her family's pond in North Carolina. Her father, um, Nathan Rourke, runs uh, the Buffalo Cove Wilderness Program. It's probably Googleable. I'm forgetting the actual name. But he runs a nature program for children where he teaches kids from across the country how to live sustainably in ways connected to nature. This is Rachel at the Twin Oaks Community Conference in Virginia. It's a conference that happens every year when there's not a pandemic, um, where people get together to learn how to live in community and to how, how to evolve their communities to live more sustainably. This is Rachel in a mud pit. I liked how her smile is almost a scream. Over the course of photographing, I, I realized that oftentimes when I read about nature or climate change, or all these this general topic of our relationship to ecology in the media, almost always science was referenced. But I realized I didn't know what the science looked like. So in the beginning of the book, I'm showing images of neuroscientists trying to measure how time and nature is essential for human learning and happiness. There's a scientist named David Strayer in, at the University of Utah who organized Maggie, the subject of this photograph, to have an EEG cap put on her head for her to look at nature in rural Utah. And then they measured her brain waves in response and then proved that time in nature, three days in wilderness, increases her human cognition. And this is Kate with an EEG cap, portable EEG cap uh, in, a, in a wild landscape in Utah. More and more people are living in cities. It's meaningful and s arguably good in terms of s efficiency for more people to live in cities um, and keep wildland wild. At the same time, uh, I was interested in how cities are seeking to reincorporate nature into an urban landscape. I went to Singapore, uh, also with National Geographic, to photograph the green architecture that was being built in a country whose population is 100% urban. This is Esme swimming in the Park Royal Hotel with layers of greenery above her there's almost twice as much greenery built into the building as there would be if the land was wild. And as me is swimming as highway traffic builds on the road below her. Sometimes those efforts are token. This is the first McDonald's in the world with a green roof and the low and ing landscaping the front yard. What I've learned over the course of the now 20 years I've spent photographing has been that the more local the, corp the collaboration and the more positive the thing is that I'm promoting, the more likely I am to make change. So one of my earliest projects in college that I actually returned to for this most recent book was on a community garden in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, in this case, this is Francisco before boxing practice, stopping by the garden where they're taking abandoned urban lots and allowing people to grow food. And in many of those garden gardens, community gardens, you have eight or nine cultures of people 
sharing a, a, a section of land and getting to know each other by the process of coming together to grow food. So over the years, I've returned again and again to try to help the Southside Community Land Trust because I believe in the values that they represent and, and it feels meaningful to be able to use photographs to promote what they do. Um, this is Madeleine in a study on virtual reality uh, in Sweden. The, the scientist was trying to determine if virtual nature was also a stress reducer. Um, she did find that um, bird sounds help. Because I had a story that the warden of the Rikers Island jail complex in New York could believe in, that I was trying to photograph positive examples of government programs that connected people to nature. Um, I was allowed into Rikers Island jail complex when it was on complete lockdown because the New York Times and the New Yorker had published reports of abuse of the people who were there by guards. And there were riots and the prison whole system, the jail complex was on lockdown. I was allowed in for a week. Um, I got to know Troy, who is one of the participants of the greenhouse program in which people learn to garden on five organic gardens that are within the barbed wire fence. When I made these photographs and published them in National Geographic and then gave copies back to the Horticultural Society of New York, which helps to run the garden, um, the positive press incentivized this jail complex, which is famous for its violence and injustice, to expand the size of the gardens. So for me, it's one example of finding a piece within an unjust whole to, to promote. And by promoting it, I can help it grow. I still think we need all of, the, all of the journalism about the injustice going on in the world right now. And I also think we need storytellers to be picturing what the world could be. So hopefully we can grow into that. It's the Malaysian house in a rainforest biome in Cornwall, England, to allow the people who go to have an authentic experience in that landscape. And Zing in an aviary in Singapore. And a greenway in Seoul, South Korea. I photographed Nate on his first day of working as a cutter, felling trees on a, on, on a clear cut in Oregon. I like the humanness of his expression here in the sense that he's feeling something in connection to the thing he's about to do. It's, I oftentimes hear and see in stories about the logging industry uh, people vilifying loggers. I think the practice of clear cutting should end. I think we should move towards selective cutting and sustainable forest management. At the same time, every hipster I know loves wood floors. And I think if we were to take a step back from vilification that is so easy in election years, to see the reasons that people do the jobs they do and to trace what they're doing and who's buying it in the long run, I think that empathy could help to change more than a vilification could. Um, I tried during this project differently than I'd photographed previously to increase the depth of field and try to show an entire industry in a picture. So with this, I'm showing the forest growing behind it. Some areas are replanted, some areas are still wild, wild in quotation marks. Uh, the lumber mill and the lumber and, and the lumber itself and the people working. This project is organized from starting in cities and ending in wilderness. 
with images of people immersed in nature on either end. So it sort of begins and ends with references to Eden. And then in the middle, in the main sequence of the book and the exhibitions, I start with cities and move to forest, to farm, to desert, to ice, to ocean, and lava. So the most, the landscape most shaped by people to the landscape least shaped by people. In every sequence, I wanted to include stories that showed a positive interaction. In this case, this is Jason igniting a controlled burn with the U.S. Forest Service in California. I included a few, a few of these photographs here to show you today because the air outside of my studio is gray from forest fire smoke. And it's been gray for weeks. And we spend 99% of our budget suppressing wildfires compared to 1% of the budget spent on fires doing controlled burns to prevent out of control wildfires. I think if we were to shift that percentages, that percentage, and give more support towards prevention, Lord, I'd be grateful for that right now. Um, fires in these landscapes oftentimes will also help the soil retain carbon. Um, they'll also um, allow new growth by clearing out fallen brush. There are people who know a lot more about that than I do, but I've tried to use these pictures to then bring attention and point that attention towards the, the microphones of people who I think just deserve to have a louder voice. This is also in a controlled burn. This is Kinley with a bag of bull testicles at a branding in rural Texas, in the town of Silverton. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've mentioned the town of Silverton many times over the course of the talk so far. Um, it's a town where I know an, an old retired cowboy named Tom. And because I know Tom, I, I've met most of this town over the years. And whenever magazines call me to do a story in rural America, I usually just use it, use it as an opportunity to go visit Tom. Because I've learned that if I could get to know a small town, through that small town, I could get to know the dynamics of a rural landscape. There's one line I heard early on in photography that the best photographs come from your own backyard. And while I've only shown you one photograph from my family's farm, the years I've spent and the decades I've spent now getting to know families and getting to be friends with people in rural America has allowed me to make stories across the United States in places that feel familiar. And because they feel familiar, over the years, they've come to feel like my backyard. This is Jesus, Jose, and Luis harvesting heirloom organic vegetables in Hollister, California. And Alicia, uh, she's clearing land for farming, also in the same valley in Hollister. I love the red of her scarf and the red of the fire going up behind her. This is ice used to protect orange trees during the extreme cold. There's so much new technology that farmers can buy to like keep their plants alive during the extreme weather when in fact it's still frozen water that insulates plants most efficiently. I love that there are old technologies that still maintain their relevance. And I went, I partnered actually with uh, the Sierra Club to photograph um, agricultural experiment stations. They're parts of the USDA and kind of connected to the land grant universities of every state. This greenhouse was in Geneva, New York and the researchers there are tasked with developing new crops for extreme weather by breeding domestic crops with their wild relatives. Um, I it took me by surprise, but I didn't know that in the wild land are relatives of grapes and apples and, it's, and all, all the plants that we eat. And through those relatives there's a genetic variety that allows us to make grapes that will survive drought or makes apple, make apples or other fruits or, or vegetables that will survive extreme cold. 
when I went to photograph, I also just loved the surreal color of the fire coming from inside the building as the ice hang over the edges and the blue sky above, or the blue clouds above it. The book is edited by subject, but I also tried to make each photograph link um, by color, composition, and content. When I go out and photograph, it feels very intuitive. Friends of friends, or me reacting to the places I find myself. I think editing is more rational. Another thing I love about photography is that I'm able to combine the very emotional and intuitive parts of myself with the very logical and technical and rational parts of myself. This is a photograph of a place that Tom, my friend in Silverton, Texas, brought me to. That was an abandoned farm that got bought up by a company that then installed wind turbines. Uh, the farm was abandoned because um, the reservoir, the aquifer, sorry, the, the water underneath the ground has been drying up and making farming uh, less reliable in a place where the weather is also becoming erratic. So wind turbines become the new kind of farm coming in and wind farms are taking um, the place of former cotton farms across the rural American West and especially in the panhandle of Texas. These are palm trees without water in California. And Dave and Jenny, I made a, I learned a real important lesson about photographic practice with this photo shoot because I met Dave and Jenny and they were doing a bathing suit shoot in a desert like hundreds of miles from water along this abandoned farmhouse. And I made pictures that I really liked of them and then I wrote their names down on my one line model release that's very easy for people to understand and, um, and it also allows me to get their address so I said, can send copies back to them. It's a practice that I've maintained since the beginning. Uh, it's very important to me um, for the people I photograph to be the first people who see their images. Um, but after I wrote Dave and Jenny's name down, on the model release, I put it on top of my car as I was putting my camera back in the car seat. And I left the model release on top of my car as I drove off. And I lost the release. And I, never, I wasn't able to find it again. And so their names are not actually Dave and Jenny. I just thought they looked like a Dave and that she looked like a Jenny. But I really regret not being able to give them this picture. And a thing I learned from that that I've done ever since is I now photograph my model release right after I photograph each person. So that 100 years from now, if I disappear and my model releases burn up, someone could look back through my digital archive um, with all of these medium format images and know exactly who's photographed and when and how, and have some idea of the backstory. This is Allie waving to town in rural Nevada. So much of what I've mentioned so far focuses on my collaborations with different groups, right? Whether the people I'm photographing, the scientists, the workers, the companies, or the media that I'm collaborating with to get stories out in the world that I care about, National Geographic, Sierra Club, et cetera. Um, I always try to leave room for myself to find meaningful images outside of my assignments. This is a photograph that for me is sort of like the Rosetta Stone of the series. I see the car and the industry and the, and the J store truck stop and the cattle car behind it. But the relationship of the logo on the back of that pickup truck and the mountains that are actually wild, if barren, but still wild. And the color of the whole thing of the reds and the blues it felt meaningful to include this picture in the book, even though it wasn't part of any one assignment or part of any one specific story. It felt like it spoke to a larger idea. So I've kept it with me. Um, Lucas, if I may uh, sure. jump in, um, I'd like to open it up to questions at this point. We can continue looking at images as well, of course. Um, but there are a couple of questions for you in the chat room and would you be okay uh, responding to those. Yes, easily. I'll breathe. Uh, here's one from Diana McClure. 
Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on the relationship between land and indigenous populations and their knowledge of living in harmony with and respect for nature? Does mm -hmm. centering that history help us move forward? I like the idea from Gertrude Stein that then there's using everything. I think that there are practices, especially with the controlled burns that native populations across the United States have used for generations. Um, I think there's, there are sustainable farming practices that have been used for generations. So short answer, yes, there's so much that needs to happen in collaboration with native populations. And I believe, as I hope I've tried to explain that there's, there's knowledge from all sides, right? There are government programs that are currently underfunded, like these images from NOAA um, and, and you know, as photographing climate science and renewable energy to controlled burns to farming. So that, so the short answer, yes. I think that we need to be in a more direct dialogue. I think that giving reservations, um, infrastructure socially and, and also just in terms of basic uh, of freedoms um, could be transformative. I'm working with a group right now at the Navajo Reservation um, in Arizona that's trying to replace the infrastructure built for coal-fired power plants with solar fields, solar panels and solar fields. So that's, that's actually a prime example of um, the Diné people taking a, a modern technology that did not come from the Diné people into their reservation and using it because it matches their values. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Here's another question from Sao Tanak. Sure. Um, I'd say, especially in the project about Amish people, I see nature, um, she puts it in quotation marks, which is more like a human centralized image. The nature they live in looks like uh, nature image that humans have created. Personally, that is the interesting point through your work rather than only reading harmony between nature and human. So I guess um, it's, it's a little bit more of a comment than a question, but perhaps you could um, expand a little bit on that about the idea of harmony um, between nature's and, nature and humans. Yeah, I, don't wanna, I wanna be clear that like I'm not trying to photograph harmony specifically. To me, sometimes the, ten the tension is what's interesting, that where people have ideals and they don't always work out in the way that we intend. Right? For instance, this is an elk at the Game and Fish Department in Wyoming, where they were trying to stop people from hunting elk off season. And they took a taxidermied elk and put it out in the wild and waited for someone to shoot it. But after months of waiting, at least what the ranger told me is that no one shot a stuffed elk. So they brought it back to decorate their hallway. Um, I like the idea that I can go off with my own ideals and look with those, I take those ideals, but also look at them critically in response to the world. I put people at the center of my projects because at least for me, it allows me relate to someone relating to landscape, which make that makes me feel more intimately connected to that landscape that I'm photographing. Um, here's a question from Jack Miles. Um, do you feel it is essential to build relationships with people before photographing them? And I'd like to piggyback on that question, just add a little, a little something to it as well that interests me. Um, and, and it's a question about your personal lifestyle. And I'm just curious if it overlaps significantly in ways with the people you photograph. Sometimes, but not always. I think there's a tremendous diversity in the world. And so in answer to the first question, I think it's essential to have trust of the people I photograph. In this instance, I am 100 feet underneath the surface of a glacier looking up at a researcher named Kenzie for the Juno Icefield Research Program in Alaska. I would not be alone 100 feet inside beneath the surface of a glacier in a crevasse unless I had a full trust of Kenzie. And they wouldn't let me down there unless they trusted me in the first place. 
And so, I mean, this is a more extreme example, but it's important to me to be in connection with people. I find a lot of times that when the news and people in, in media in general and in art go to photograph rural America, they photograph based on preconceived notions. You can tell someone's a visitor because the, what, the story they're telling matches the stereotype of a place. And I'm tr I try the best I can to have the stories I share come out of my experiences in a place rather than be what I assume I will find before I get there. Um, here's a question from Daniel LaRose. Um, much of your work relies on seeking new relationships, environments, and intimate interactions with your subjects. How has your practice or process changed since COVID and its restrictions? It's been an incredibly challenging time. Um, we've been trying to support social justice movements, albeit from a distance. Um, I'm living in a warehouse that my fiance runs called Monument in San Francisco. It's, a, it's the only legal event space where artists can live in downtown San Francisco. Um, my housemates are acrobats and artists and techies. And I feel very far away from the landscape that I, would ex that I expected to be photographing right now. At the same time, because I'm home and I've had more time at home than I expected, I, I found in my archive a series of pictures I made when I was 19 in New York, just after the September 11th attacks, portraits on the streets of New York City. And I shared them with a, a British publisher called Stanley Barker and they agreed to do a book and now we're working on a book. Um, it's not the series I expected to be photographing right now, but it feels meaningful to be preparing a book for the 20th anniversary of the attacks next year. And also one that has a reminder in it to approach strangers with compassion across social distances. Um, so I think this effect, this pandemic affects everyone some people much more than others. I feel really lucky and I've tried to still be useful and active in my practice. Um, here's a question from Sophia and I think you referred to this um, at least uh, partially during your talk, but uh, here it goes. When photographing alongside the groups of off-grid peoples, would you emulate their living lifestyle their living style during your stay or continue living the way you personally do? Yeah, I found I'm not good at pretending. My mom says, tell the truth. It's the easiest thing to remember. And so when I was going to visit families who are living off grid, I was sharing, I was trying to learn things. I was helping them in any way that I could, but I was not walking around wearing animal hides <laughs> or starting all my fires by friction. I did my best to learn how to start a fire by friction but it, it, I wasn't relying on it to live. Uh, at the same time, when the, when, before the book was published, I got an, a phone call from a magazine in Italy and they said they wanted to do a review of my pictures. I said, well, there's not much, you know, I just have these pictures, a little website. And they said, well, send us your pictures. So I sent them my pictures and they published my photographs and never called me for an interview. And some Italian relatives who still live near Naples and Rome called me and said, you know, it says that you're a radical survivalist who wears animal hides and hunts and gathers all your food and that you photographed your own people in a newly discovered subculture that, that's tens of thousands of people strong. And none of that is true. At the same time, I asked my grandfather, Guido Folia, what I should do. And he said, it, he asked me, he's like, is that story gonna help sell more books? And I said, probably. And she said, then don't correct it. Let them think what they want to think. I don't know that I believe in that. I've spent a, I spent a pretty good amount of energy correcting um, factually incorrect things from the stories I'm trying to tell in the world. But that story definitely helped me sell books in Italy. Uh, I also want well, to add uh, yeah. one more thing. The pandemic is a fantastic time. The shelter in place 
to make phone calls and send letters to encourage people to vote. Uh, we've been sending a lot of letters and making a lot of phone calls right now. Mm -hmm. The up upcoming election feels quite important. Um, thank you for being so candid and in, in general, just for your eloquence tonight and, and the wonderful photographs. Um, it's, it's, you know, important for all of us to be nimble, to stay open to possibility and sometimes to just accept that there's things beyond our control um, that get lost in translation or, you know. Sure, um, one is key. Like, thing, yeah. and more question, but I wanted to end the project I was just showing you with a, with a picture of the cleanest air on earth. Mm. And I went to the spot and I spent a long time photographing plants and rocks and it didn't work, nothing felt interesting. And speaking of being open to surprises, when I was leaving, I met a couple, Goda and Lev, on their first date. And, you know, wearing clothes, obviously, and walking down, walking down a road. And I introduced myself, I said, hi, my name's Lucas. We started talking, I ended up at their community. They lived in a commune. Um, I, went, I went there for dinner that night and asked them the next day if they would meet me for a portrait on their second day of knowing each other in the spot with the cleanest air on earth. Felt conceptually interesting to me. I went there the next day, they met me, they showed up a few hours late, but they still met me. And then during the photo shoot, um, Goda started kissing Lev, they started making out and ended up making this photograph of them making love in the landscape with the cleanest air on earth. And I used it to close the book. It felt like a reference back to those first images that also referenced Eden. Does anyone have yes. any questions? Okay. There's, there's a few more questions and uh, we don't have a whole lot of time. So I'm not sure that I, that I can get to all of them, but let me try. Um, this is from Alvaro Kedding. Uh, how important do you think is for someone to travel to these wild landscapes and experience them physically to be able to be to better understand our relationship to nature, so the actual pilgrimage to the landscape. So I think I'm cautious of the idea that's like deep in the American subconscious, that nature is far away. It's a place you go on vacation to. Right? The reason I included the images of the community gardens and the gardens in, in, in the Rikers Island jail complex and et cetera, um, is that I think that there are, there are, there's nature nearby and also wild landscapes far away. It does feel important to have people touch nature because through direct contact, I think we have more empathy. I think I have more empathy for a forest knowing the cycles of its seasons. And so my, in my perfect future world, we would reintegrate wild landscapes into cities um, and allow people to connect to them, have schools bring students into nature and connection with nature. Some of the, the, the areas of the country that have the least plant life are schoolyards. I think we could go a long way starting there. And I think seeing a big wild landscape makes a difference too. Um, here's uh, what will be our final question for tonight um, from uh, our chair, Tom Ash. He says, I, I love this idea of making photographs through friendship and appreciate the idea of photographing your model releases. If you don't mind sharing, what does your one line model release say? Oh, I have to find it. <laughs> oh. Tom, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No problem. That's fine. <laughs> Copy me. It says, Copy. You, give, you, you, you give permission to Lucas Folia to make, to make and use your photograph. Um, and then email, date, email, name, address, phone number. Something really simple. Um, and yeah, I th one last note about community is that Everyone is stuck at home. Most, rather, most people are stuck at home. People who are essential workers, people who are working on front lines are obviously not. Um, but with so much things closed, there's ample time for letters. So for all of you students, one thing I'd recommend, or for talk, anyone um, practicing art in general right now, is build community, right? Write at least a few letters or emails 
to artists you respect. Just say who you are and where you come from, share what you made, and ask a question to, to, to start a conversation. Share some work. I think it's, it's through letters like that and, and, and friendships I've made over the years that have allowed the art part of what I do in galleries, museums, magazines, etc., possible. So focus on your own work, reach out, have your work relate to the world, and I hope we can change it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Lucas, once again. Um, for an evening of inspiration, I, we could talk for another two hours easily, particularly about the subject of photography and activism and, and how you define it and how we've experienced it ourselves. And um, it was a really inspiring evening. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Lucas, we appreciate you, and please stay in touch.